Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for April 12th, 2024. I'm going to start with a few headlines and then I'll take up some of the questions that I've received. And I did receive a number of questions and there's some very good ones. So let's just start with a follow-up to yesterday's report on the visit of Japan's Prime Minister Kishida, who continued his trip to Washington with an address to Congress. Now, the story coming out is that Japan is now establishing itself as one of America's most trusted allies. For what purpose? For confronting China in the Pacific, for joining with uh, the British, the Australians, the South Koreans, and the United States as a containment operation against China, with the expectation, they say, that China will launch a military strike uh, against Taiwan. Now, the idea of the military partnership was at his center of his address to Congress, where he showed his loyalty to Biden by making a plea for the House of Representatives to pass the aid bill for Ukraine. So the, the thing to note is this whole idea of the Pacific shift, as this goes back to what Obama was trying to do with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which failed, because the obvious point is that these countries have a certain relationship with China, which is a mutually beneficial relationship. And even though there's some muscle flexing and so on, they're not prepared to go to war. In the meantime, with the two key allies in Asia being Japan and South Korea, both of their governments are collapsing in, in support as the polls show. And with Australia and the United Kingdom as two of the other bulwarks of this alliance, uh, this is the old empire, the old British empire. Now, add to that that they're expecting that India will join them. And it's not so clear. The Indians are not so gung-ho for military confrontation as they're trying to advance their own economy. So the whole strategy is weak. It's based on a war mentality. And it's dictated from the think tanks that represent the corporate cartels and control the Congress. It, it's a sad commentary on what the United States has become. Now, then you have Ukraine, where Russia is effectively destroying Ukraine's electric grid. There is wailing coming from Kiev, but also from the capitals of Europe. Help us, save us, give us Patriot missiles, give us anti-aircraft capabilities, give us more weapons. But yesterday, the Ukrainian parliament, with a very small number of people actually in the parliament to vote, voted to have a new draft implemented to take people from 18 to, I think it's 64 years old, into the Ukrainian military, including men and women. This is another sign of the overall desperation. They're running out of ammunition. They're running out of, of people. NATO is a panic in a panic over this, and the question in NATO capitals is, what will the United States do? And that's a good question. Will Speaker Johnson do an end around and, and the opposition from the MAGA conservatives and the Trump networks to get the bill passed to provide another $60 billion to the war? Or will there be an impulse to have a negotiated settlement? And then on Gaza, we still face the danger of a wider war. The momentary pullback by Israel is by no means an effort to achieve a permanent ceasefire. Uh, that's being called for increasingly. But the Israelis, as long as they have the pledge of Joe Biden that the U.S. will give them whatever they need, they're not going to accept a permanent ceasefire. In the meantime, <clears throat> you have the danger of an escalation against Iran. And the expectation that's being spoken of at the UN in Tel Aviv and Washington, that Iran is going to have a strike to retaliate, all of that plays into the breakaway ally scenario, which essentially says that there should be a um, retaliation. Uh, if re Iran retaliates, there should be a U.S. involvement in the war. Extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous. Now, let me take three questions that came in. The first one is, 
what is behind the evil policies of the United States? Why are they doing this? Why, why do the war hawks have so much power? And this is a question I get all the time. And I, I would say there are three things. One is the post-Cold War arrogance, the idea that we won. We won and therefore we can dictate the terms of trade and finance and, and relationships to the whole world. That's the idea of the unipolar order. And it's like a bunch of little leaguers jumping up and down cheering after they win a baseball game. That mentality is completely uh, antithetical to a constitutional republic, which should be operating on the basis of principle as opposed to an arrogant belief and hubris, which says we own the world. And, and that's one aspect of it. Now, immediately what follows from that is greed corruption, the private interests and control, that while the average person is celebrating, at least in 1990, the victory over communism, the corporate cartels looked at Russia and looked at Eastern Europe as uh, potential uh, wealth of resources to be carved up. That was the part of the idea of the shock therapy policy against Russia, and that's what Putin has been organizing to overcome. Now, when I say greed and corruption, the idea that you can make money from the defeat of an adversary and grab their resources, impose so-called free market shocks so that the nation has no control over their own resources. That's this whole idea of attacking national sovereignty that comes from the World Economic Forum and, and those geniuses. And what it really amounts to is in order to fulfill the, the greedy intent of these corporate cartels, the military of the West under the direction of the United States and NATO is deployed to crush any nation which asserts its sovereignty and the right to control its own resources and economic future. The result is Iraq, we see it there, we see it in Libya, we see it in Syria, and we see the attacks now on China and Russia and Iran. What do these countries have in common? The belief that they have a sovereign right to develop their nation for the good of their people in harmony and for mutual benefit with their neighbors. Why is that so unacceptable? Well, the unipolar order starts from the idea that for us to be the policemen of the world, we need to have control over the resources and over the economic and financial institutions that determine relations between nations. And so that idea is there to, to play, to, to allow for the, the greed and the corruption. But the greed and the corruption are just a part of the drive for war as the war is to defend this order. Now, finally, and very important is the moral breakdown of the people in the West. Uh, Russia's foreign minister Lavrov talks about post-Christian world in the West. But in a sense, what, what are we looking at? The domination of celebrity culture, of entertainment, of drug, rock, sex, counterculture, the rejection of the idea that the future is important. In fact, you have large numbers of, of groups of millennials who are joining organizations called the last generation. They believe that the world is going to end because of climate change and, and war. And therefore, what's their goal? Grab all the pleasure they can now while they're still alive. Now, this kind of apocalyptic dystopian view is not the predominant one, but it's dominant enough. And you see it on television, you see it in the movies, you see it in the, the so-called music, uh, the, the, even the, the fashion. You see people running away from this idea of the dignity of a human being who works for a better future. And instead, someone who's trying to squeeze every bit of pleasure they can out of their short term of existence. And it's that moral breakdown which is a problem. And, and here's where you see the, the turning away from God, turning away from natural law, turning away from the principle of, of having international law to defend human civilizations, 
and instead, what's in it for me? What can I get out of it? And it's created a culture, a political culture, a sociological culture, uh, an urban culture, in which we're seeing the law of the jungle being asserted in the so-called rules-based order. And that's what's behind this breakdown. And it all goes back to the idea that we won the Cold War and therefore we have the right to dictate policy to everyone. Now, the next question, and, and this is a, a very interesting one, if the o OASIS plan is implemented, and I got this, by the way, from several people from uh, Middle Eastern countries, if the o OASIS plan is implemented, that is the LaRouche plan, and I'll mention this later because there's a conference on this starting tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern time. If the OASIS plan is implemented, how can you be sure it will be fair, not just to the benefit of the global corporations and financial institutions? Well, that's a fair question because there are corporations that are already scheming how they can get the oil and gas offshore Gaza or how they could use a cheap labor source of Palestinians for sweatshops uh, in Gaza and, and elsewhere, and, and how they can use the Israeli military to enforce these policies. Well, if, if we don't change the overall fundamental thinking of nations, that's probably what would happen. Uh, but it's, it's unlikely that they would even follow through with the OASIS plan uh, because there's there's no interest in, for them in greening the desert for the sake of the people who live there. So what it requires is an overall change in thinking. And what I mean by that is what, what Helga Zepp-LaRouche has been saying, and this goes back to what her hus husband, Lyndon LaRouche, always said, you have to overturn the axioms, axioms which say it's a zero-sum game, and your gain is my loss, my gain is your loss, just deal with it. Well, no, we, we have to have a commitment to the idea of an improved future based on advancing the potential creative power of the whole population. That's what gives you productivity gains that can sustain economic growth. Now, how does it become fair? You have to change the thinking of people away from the me, 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 uh, it's all what's in my best interest, to what is the mutual benefit for all, the common good, the general welfare. These are principles that actually go back to the Bible. They go back to religious teachings. All the great religions have some form of that, whether it's the golden rule, the do unto others as you would have them do unto you, this idea was enshrined in the principle of the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 that said nations should not interfere in the affairs of others, but instead should act to be good neighbors by recognizing that other people have the same interests as you, and therefore there is a basis for cooperation and mutual benefit. Now, if you change the thinking away from the present idea, which is how can I get over? How can I somehow gain more of a, a bigger piece of a shrinking pie? And instead you think about how do we increase the size of the pie for everyone so that everyone can participate in increasing the total wealth available and therefore give more people a fair and just piece of, those, of that product. That's the fight that we have to have. And it means we have to overcome the apocalyptic visions that dominate society today. The dog eat dog, it's a jungle out there mentality. And instead return to the values of the great religions. And that's the fight that we have to wage. If we do that and get nations thinking again <clears throat> that their interests depends on other nations meeting the interests of their people, then we can have the kinds of institutional stability that will guarantee that, that one group of private interests cannot take the benefit of the work of all nations. And I would recommend on this that people look at Helga Zeplerusch's fundamental principles. It's going to be appended to the description section 
and the most important, I think, are the last couple, which talk about this na the idea of human nature, that man is inherently good, provided he's not corrupted by the private greed that we see today dominating. And so how do we get back to that, that uh, idea of the uh, good human nature? Well, that depends on all of us, and it depends on having an optimistic view of man as opposed to succumbing to this idea that every human being is a competitor trying to take away from me, me, me. So that's the change in thinking that's required to make sure something like the OASIS plan <clears throat> or any other development plan can work. Now, the final question was, um, and this is a personal question, actually. LaRouche was vilified. You, Harley, and Helga are on a target list uh, run by the Ukrainian secret services. There's censorship against you on Facebook, YouTube, and so on. So how do you keep doing this every day? What drives you? Well, I would say it's optimism. And again, optimism about the nature of man. Being able to develop insights through looking critically at your own thinking and being able to see the extent to which you succumbed to the pessimism and the brainwashing around you. Now, I come from a family which includes uh, generations that emigrated to the United States from Poland, from Austria-Hungary, from Germany, seeking a better life, not just for themselves, but for the future, for their children and grandchildren. And it was that optimism which was passed on to me by my mother, who is an extremely optimistic person, sometimes overly so, but who essentially had this belief that human beings are good and what's necessary is to create the circumstances both in the large society and the small, that is having government function for the general welfare and have family relations operate on the, the basis of participating in a society which does have the general welfare at its heart. And what you find is if you think that way, you can then look at the axioms that dominate society and see where the flaws are in most people's thinking. And it gives you the strength if you take it on in yourself and in your family members. It gives you the strength to go out into the society at, at large and ignore the idiocy that's thrown at you and instead fight for that higher principle of man in the image of God and that it's up to us to create the circumstances where that aspect of human nature can predominate. And so that's what drives me. That's what keeps me going. Uh, even when I get a speck in my eye, I, I continue to talk and continue to, to hope that my ideas can reach people and inspire people to act for the good. And so one way to do that, organize everyone you know to participate in the conference tomorrow, uh, Saturday, April 13th, the Schiller Institute online conference on the OASIS project. Uh, our organization operates from that principle, that we are born for that which is better, as Schiller put it. And to do that, you have to fight your own internal demons and then use the strength from that fight to help others overcome their doubts and fears. So thanks for your questions. Thanks for joining me. And I'll see you hopefully tomorrow at the conference on the OASIS plan.